Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Analyst with TRICOM. TRICOM is pleased to introduce our Industry Insider webinar series. The purpose of this series is to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. Our presenter today is Greg Blackwell from Great Performance Coaching. In Greg's 30 years of experience in the sales field, he learned what it takes to succeed. He's been a quota-busting top performer in sales and management, receiving public recognition for his achievements. His unique ability is to identify the root obstacle holding you back, then giving you the strategies and skills you need to get superior results. He's developed hundreds of sales pros into top performers. However, his true passion has always been to make a difference in the lives of others, helping sales professionals lead happier and more productive lives. This passion and sales experience led Greg to launch Great Performance Co Coaching to help others achieve their potential. Greg teaches his clients how to become great performers by using street-tested processes and skills that are efficient, effective, and enjoyable. Great Performance Coaching provides high-impact workshops, invigorating keynote speeches, and insightful executive coaching services to leading companies to give them an edge. Greg teaches people strategies, tactics, and execution so they get better results faster. In today's Industry Insider webinar, we will cover part two of the three biggest mistakes in selling staffing services. By the end of the session, you'll be able to strengthen relationships and increase sales in existing accounts, as well as become the staffing business partner of choice for your ideal prospects. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the chat feature located on the right toolbar and submit questions to all panelists. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us our feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. I will now turn the floor over to Greg. Well, thank you, Amanda, and welcome to everyone. Happy Memorial Day week. I hope you had a good weekend. What I'd like to do is go into first a brief overview of what we covered last time in the August of 2012 webinar. And if you find part of today's topic interesting, but I don't go into a lot of detail, it's likely because it's on that August 2012 webinar, which you can find on the TRICOM website. So let's get started. What we'll talk about today is the big three mistakes that people make. Second, I want to focus on mistake number two, having to do with the sales process. And then the third topic, we're going to go deep into a strategic questioning funnel that you can use to get out in front of RFPs as well as elicit more information with less work from the people you talk to. Mistake number one. David Serge with Haley Marketing wrote a white paper on this. It's really good. You should uh, pull it and read it. In essence, if you differentiate yourself as we have great service, well, Think about this. What if you went to 10 suppliers to call on you and asked them to differentiate themselves? They're likely to give you some version of, well, we have great service. Well, how would you feel after hearing that several times? A bit skeptical? It might even become cynical. So, uh, yeah, we're in a service business, but people try to differentiate on service. So if you want to differentiate in a memorable way, it's going to have to be on something else. And there are a lot of suggestions in uh, David's white paper on that about how you can go deeper or you can bring in Haley Marketing, if you wish, as a partner. Mistake number two has to do with the sales process. Pitching your services versus selling an insight-based solution, probably a mistake. Harvard Business Review put out a, a white paper last year on insight selling. Now, there's a company named Challenger that went really deep with it, and while I admire their bravado, I don't agree with their approach. It's quite provocative. It's not for everyone. But they make some great points. They say that solution selling is dead. I don't agree. And that insight selling is the new holy grail of how to sell more. 
Well, I do agree with the premise that insight selling is important, but let's talk more about that. A recent corporate executive board study of more than 1,400 business-to-business customers, they found that they completed 60% of their purchasing decision, things like researching solutions, ranking their options, setting the requirements, benchmark pricing, and so on, before even having a conversation with a supplier. In this world, the celebrated solution sales rep had become more of an annoyance than an asset. In fact, customers are often much ahead of the salespeople who are trying to help them. In solution selling, the reps were asking generic questions to uncover a need that they've solved for another client, just like that one, and then they propose their solution. It's not a bad approach, and it will still work today, but only on large, well-established firms that by now have a clear understanding of their needs, and hence they immediately shop for the best price. Does that sound familiar? Well, insight selling requires research and analysis and spotting trends to help prospects avoid potential problems that lie ahead. It requires the rep to capitalize on their experience. They must bring valuable data and insights to the table to credentialize themselves today and encourage the customer to think differently. Now, here's an example. Uh, Crystal and I own a boutique staffing firm. We're based in Atlanta. One of the trends that we discovered is that retiring boomers with critical skills and knowledge were leaving the workforce, and many companies were uh, encouraging them to retire because of rising benefit costs. We went in and showed one employer how to streamline the onboarding process for their replacements, cut the time, lower the expense. We started with one office, and now we handle the entire country for this company. So in addition to thinking differently and showing demographic trends, uh, staffing firms have to also follow a process. If you remember the book Good to Great by Jim Collins, one of the many great things he said in there, he said, the hallmark of mediocrity isn't marginal product. It's inconsistency. In other words, the customer experience needs to be consistent, not only for an individual sales route, but by the entire field force of that firm. So how do you build those kinds of capabilities? Well, you can go out and build it yourself. You can go buy it. You can rent it. Or you could do a joint venture alliance with another firm who's already mastered it. Another mistake that's part of the sales process is the mentality of management, where the sales force is managed, not coached. Now, management's important. We have to establish clear direction. We have to provide motivation, clear measures, but coaching is where you get the extra return on investment. Here's the difference. In managing, you're telling your observations to people. In coaching, you're sharing your perceptions and you're exploring the options. You let them come to the conclusion. Therefore, they have their own epiphany. That's the secret to lasting change. If you use the carrot and the stick, then eventually your people become either weary of the stick or you've got to offer bigger and bigger carrots. The way to keep good sales talent around in the long run is you've got to create a happy work environment for them. And we found that coaching them, allowing them to be part of the solution is a key ingredient to keeping happy, productive employees. So in managing, you're directing, and you decide. In coaching, you're facilitating a thought process. They decide. They own the results. In managing, you use authority, and you get short-term change. But in collaborating, you get lasting behavioral change. In managing, management decides the what and the how. But in coaching, they're open to a variety of how. We're hard on the issue, 
but we're easy on the person. Mistake number three is when the sales force has undeveloped personal skills. And there are six crucial skills that I coach on. The first one is called gravitas, which is an executive presence that commands respect. You've met people like that. The second one is connecting with others or quickly establishing a bond or a relationship. The third one is the skill of questioning. We're going to go deeper on that in today's workshop. But it's the skill of eliciting information in a conversational and customer-focused way, not an interrogation. The fourth skill is active listening versus passive listening. In other words, you want to understand what they meant, not just what they said. The fifth skill of hitching or positioning is the skill of linking your solution to their expressed needs in a compelling way. It's a way of leveraging the answers to their questions from your listening and using it to position how your solution satisfies their stated needs using their language. The sixth skill is verifying or checking. You're checking for feedback. The difference between questioning and checking or verifying. Questioning, you're eliciting information. In verifying, you're eliciting feedback. And why? Because clients are tired of being closed. They don't want to be put in a headlock and give it a noogie to buy something. So the skill of verifying gets you a higher win rate by verifying throughout every conversation. It starts in the opening dialogue when you first sit down. So let's now go deeper on the sales process, the focus of today's call. There's actually a flow that should occur throughout the entire sales call, and it should be consistent from call to call. Your questions will vary depending upon your target audience, but the flow is the same. Let's first talk about the opening. In the opening, you want to create a personal or professional report. You know, the most mundane way we do it is, how was your commute into work? Or how was the weather where you are if you're on the phone? You can go deeper than that if you have notes on your prospect in your CRM. Then you position your agenda for the meeting, including the benefit to the customer of actively engaging in the dialogue. Then you stop and ask a checking question. Does this meet your needs? What would you like for me to emphasize or de-emphasize? What would you add or change to today's agenda? You'd also do a time check. Hey, we had set aside an hour for today's call. Does that still work for your schedule? From the opening, you would then offer a relevant insight. It could be based on your research of industry trends, changes in the competitive landscape, or responses to the current economic environment. You could concisely position an insight into how other customers like them are addressing the issue or trend that's affecting that customer. Can you check? What are your thoughts on that? The questioning funnel. I'm going to go deeper on this in a moment in minute detail. If you don't already have it out, can I encourage you to have a pencil or a pen and paper handy? In the last workshop, I received a lot of requests for the speaker's notes, and I'm sorry, but I don't send those out. So you'll want to take notes on the questions that you hear that resonate with you or that you find effective. But they come in three general areas of this questioning funnel, a strategic context, the potential opportunities, and then the decision criteria being used. Here's an example. In the strategic context, First, you might ask a vision question where you want to understand a long-term qualitative goal that the organization wants to achieve. Typically, these kinds of goals, they take more than a year to achieve. Um, for example, they might say, well, we will have the industry reputation as the company customers love to work with. And if that's your vision, fine. Now, what you might say with the C executive who shared that with you, Ask them a question like, hey, 
your company's achievements are impressive. What's the long-term vision guiding that success? Another question you could ask. I would even recommend you ask them in this order. The second question is the business objectives in order to achieve that vision. Discover the short-term or less than a year quantitative objectives necessary in order to achieve the vision. Often, a number of high-level objectives contribute to achieving the overall vision. A question there might be something like, what steps are you taking in order to achieve that vision? Or how are you measuring progress? The third question I would ask if I'm talking to a C-level executive would be in the range of challenging issues that should be removed. You want to identify the obstacles that the customer is experiencing in trying to reach those objectives. In general, these issues are, are what stakeholders focus on and what they worry about. I found there are four types of issues. It could be one, the competition. Second, market issues. Third, financial issues. Or fourth, operational issues. An example of a good question you might ask here would be, hey, what else is hindering your team's ability to meet the important objectives that you just uncovered in question number two? Strategic initiatives then need to be discovered that address the challenging issues. You want to explore the customer organization's high-level response to every challenging issue they share with you. Now, usually, these strategic initiatives are currently underway or they're planned for the near future or they may be under consideration by management and might be confidential at this time. But these initiatives can become potential opportunities for you. The critical success factors, well, let me go back and give you an example. For strategic initiative, what the question might sound like is, how has your company or your team responded to the challenges that you uncovered in question number three? So question number three was, what's hindering your team's ability to meet these important objectives? Followed up by, and how has your company responded to these challenges? Now, the fifth question has to do with the critical success factors for each initiative. So for each strategic initiative, discuss a few things that the customer absolutely must have in place so that you can contribute to the success of the initiative. A question you might ask here might be, well, what's most important to ensuring the success of your initiative, the one they just shared with you? So at the strategic level, those are five different questions you might ask at the C level that will help you drill down in the way they think long-term impact on the business at a strategic level. Let's now go to the middle of the funnel. Let's talk about the opportunity. Sometimes with mid-sized firms and certainly with smaller firms, you will start at the strategic level and go straight on into the opportunity level. If you're dealing with larger firms, complex firms, you would do strategic context questions with C-level executives, drop it, let them uh, refer you to someone else in the organization, another stakeholder, a line of business head, and you might start into the opportunity questions at that level. So let's talk about the types of questions in the opportunity section of the questioning funnel. The first type of question might be the current situation. Here, you're trying to uncover the customer's current situation or their operation and their processes. You want to determine where the customer is today with regard to the challenging issues and the strategic initiatives that led you to identify the opportunity for you. What that question might sound like is, what are you currently doing with regard to, and then mention, whatever initiative or uh, strategic initiative that the senior level executive, the C-level executive, it shared with you earlier. What are you currently doing with regard to, and then mention the initiative? The second question you would ask 
would do with the, would have to do with the level of satisfaction. In other words, you want to understand what's working and what needs to be changed. What that sounds like is, hey, may I ask, how is that working? And what would you do differently? The third question has to do with the desired situation, the ideal, where you want to explore what the customer envisions as the ideal solution or outcome. The question is pretty straightforward. What does the ideal solution look like to you? See, many sales reps, they go in there trying so hard to be clever and witty and thought-provoking and, and, and impress the customer with how smart they are. But you know what I found? What really impresses a small business owner or a C-level executive is the quality of questions that you ask based on your research in preparing for that interview in the first place. They can tell whether or not you understand their business, their personal challenges, or the kinds of questions that you ask. Also, sales reps, you don't have to hand them on a silver platter the ideal solution. Many times, they have a pretty good idea of what it looks like. They need your help in polishing it, making it real, doable, and given that you've called on other firms like them in a similar situation, you provide the validation they're looking for that it's field tested and it'll work. So I love the question, what does the ideal solution look like to you? Compelling events. This is asking about what's driving the organization to be interested in this type of solution at this point in time. In other words, what is the business logic that makes this important to management now? A way you could ask that question, you might say, help me understand, why is now the time to solve this issue? Now, what you're listening for, if they don't have any sense of urgency or a deadline around it, that's a big red flag. I see a lot of sales reps wasting a lot of company resources in their own time thinking they're pursuing a real opportunity when management themselves has no sense of urgency around it. You say, well, Greg, how can I get them to have a sense of urgency? You know what my answer is? You can't. If it's not a higher level priority for management, I'll make one stab at trying to get them to see what lies ahead, but they didn't get where they are without being pretty smart. So I'll trust their judgment as to what their priorities are. And if they don't see this as an urgency, um, shake the dust off your sandals, make a new plan, stand. Uh, you don't be, need to be coy, Roy. You know the rest of that song. The next level of questions has to do with the personal needs. You want to find out about their personal motivations and their goals linked to the success of an, initial, an initiative uh, or a solution. So the simple question here would be, what's most important to you? And you put the emphasis on you. That's the magic that it takes to close the sale. If you go back with intellectual linear thinking to close a sale, you've missed the boat. I think all of you on this call know from the 1980s study People make emotional decisions and then gin up intellectual rationalizations. Well, this is the, one of the most powerful questions. Deeper down in the funnel, that helps you close the sale when the time is right, when you know why it matters to them personally. So that's the middle of the funnel. Let's now move down to the bottom section of the funnel, the decision-making criteria. The first area might be, let's see. Get my pointer. Here we go. The competition. You want to identify two different forms of competition. One could be an outside provider, but the other might well be internal projects that are competing for management's attention and budget dollars right now. So what those questions might sound like is, first one would be, who else are you considering to help with this initiative? 
for the second for internal projects that are competing? The best question I've heard. What other projects like this are competing for leadership's attention? What other projects like this are competing for leadership's attention? Second area in the decision process has to do with authority. Now, in authority, you want to get the details on the decision making process, the stakeholders, the power structure, and the constraints. Let's take each of those separately. The process. Here's a question What are the key milestones in the decision making process? Let them tell you. What are the key milestones in the decision making process? The second area under authority, the stakeholders. I like how this one's worded. Other than yourself, who will be involved in the decision-making process? Now, in the small business, there's usually one person making all the decisions, or two, but not a committee. The larger the firm, the more the collaboration is required. But you want to identify up front who are the stakeholders. Now, the third area, reporting relationships. The question, here's what it might sound like. Can you help me understand how these stakeholders fit into your organization and into the decision process? I mean, who reports to whom? Under authority, the fourth area is the power structure. Here's a great way to find out the real power structure in an organization. The question would be this. Hey, in case of a tie, who will make the final decision? I love that one. Under authority, the fifth area of questioning has to do with the selection criteria. The question you might ask, Hey, when these stakeholders think about the decision before them, what factors are most important to the group? The sixth area under authority has to do with the constraints. Sometimes if you're walking in, and you, many times you are, especially on the larger uh, cases, there's an existing contract in place. You want to be careful not to spin your wheels. So what this question would sound like, what contractual constraints exist with the current provider that might delay the decision? What contractual constraints exist with the current provider that might delay the decision? So those are six different areas under authority that you would explore. Let's now talk about budget. You want to find out if a specific budget has been set aside, and if so, how much? The way you might ask the question, what resources have been allocated to this initiative? I hate to ask, you know, what's your budget? It's a little direct for some people's taste. But you could if you dress it up. You could ask, hey, what budget is in place to address this challenging issue? I like the word resources better, personally. What resources have been allocated to this initiative? The next area under the decision-making is trust. You want to ask questions to determine how familiar the stakeholders are with your firm and how they feel about your capabilities. I worked with one client. They had been dealing with one existing customer for seven years and never once asked them this question. And when they did, the answers were shocking. The customer was totally transparent about what they liked and what they didn't like about their current relationship. Frankly, what my customer learned is that the relationship was at risk. There were a few things this client was unhappy about. Well, they had taken this customer for granted for seven years. The question they asked they said, you know what, we've been working together for seven years, and I've never asked you this, but what is your impression of our firm? And the customer just gushed. 
with what they liked and what they really didn't like. And it gave my client a chance to change and make adjustments in order to maintain and sustain that relationship. Now, the bottom line here is, after you go through the questioning funnel, you're trying to figure out, is this opportunity worth pursuing before we commit more time and resources to it? But with that, you want to go a little deeper with some enrichment questions. There are three types. The first is a reaction question, where you're asking for the customer's point of view or an opinion on a specific topic. Now, these enrichment questions are not a linear progression of the ones I just covered on the questioning funnel. These are on the side that you pull out of your hat when needed during the conversation. Now, this is an art, not a science. Personally, when I go into a client um, interview, I've got my questions lined up in advance, typed in a menu that I'll pull from. I have no embarrassment about showing them my dialogue model that I'm going to go through, nor the questions that I'm working from. And if they look at my piece of paper and, hey, Greg, what is that? I'll say, this is something I brought in order to make the best use of your time today. I don't tell them it's my cheat sheet, but I don't pretend anymore to be smart enough to remember everything I want to remember in a client interview when it's a discovery interview, an exploratory interview. So enrichment questions. There are three types, and I'll give you examples of each. A reaction question. You're asking for the customer's point of view or their opinion on a specific topic. And what you might ask is, All right, what did you think about that? Or when would a trend like that become worrisome for you? Or who do you think would be most impacted if that legislation passes? Those are reaction questions. The second type of enrichment question is a relevance question. There, you're asking the customer to reflect on and discuss the relevance of the insight that you just provided to his or her situation, what that sounds like. You might say, to what extent is that happening here? Or how do you see that affecting your business or your mission? Or what kind of pressure is that creating for you? Another way. How much of that is an issue for your team? Those are relevance questions where when you position an insight, you're asking basically, hey, is this relevant to you? The third type of enrichment question is risk and reward. Here you're having a customer do a little deeper thinking. You're asking them to weigh the potential drawbacks and the benefits with you. The way you might ask the question what do you see as the potential risks and rewards of a strategy like that? Or what opportunities might this create for your company? Or what risks does that pose for your organization? Or what could be the downside of that for your organization? The goal here is to create a dialogue, not an interrogation. And I found that the more that you ask them for their opinion, their views, their thoughts, their strategies, their ideas, the more willing they are to listen to your ideas when you're ready to position them. So those are several examples of enrichment questions. In other words, enrichment questions help you get to the root cause. I found this picture, thought you might enjoy it. So after we've gone through the open, shared relevant insight, and then used the questioning funnel and listened to their answers, then we summarize the issues and have them prioritize in what order they want to address them if there's a list. You'd ask questions to elicit feedback like, how well have I summarized your needs? Or how accurately have I stated your priorities? 
From there, you want to identify other stakeholders, if it's a larger organization, and then close out the meeting. So you might ask, based on our conversation, who else should I be talking to? Who else is impacted? You want to get the customer's help in reaching that person. Nobody wants to be cold called anymore. So you would secure the customer's help. Now, I found in working with many clients on large complex deals that there are folks and organizations who don't want to share and they will try to block your access to the other stakeholders. And they'll say, oh, you've got to go through me. Many times that happens with a procurement department. Well, procurement is not where deals are done. They are part of the purchasing process. I have an entire workshop just on dealing with procurement and negotiating. That's for another uh, workshop on another day. But you want to secure the customer's help in getting to all of the key stakeholders. And you thank them for their time. That simple. So in summary, here are the three biggest mistakes that people make in selling staffing services. One, they think they're differentiating their brand as great service when in fact they just sound like everyone else. Two, they have an outdated or an inconsistent sales process. And three, they lack any of six crucial skills. So that being said, I'll turn it back over. What do we do now? Well, start your journey today. There's no time like the present to learn a new approach, establish a more consistent approach, because sales is just a lot of fun. So with that, here's my contact information. My standard tagline is that every great athlete has a personal development plan. Every great athlete has a coach. Who's yours? And for now, Amanda, I'll turn it back to you and open the floor for questions. Great. If anyone has any questions, please go ahead and submit them using the chat feature. And I will also go ahead and open up a poll so you could give us your feedback. And in the meantime, Greg, do you have any uh, other questions that you may have heard from other people that might be helpful to any of the participants today? Oh, my goodness. At the risk of overwhelming our audience, I hesitate to bring more. I think I counted um, 30-something questions that I threw out in this one. I'm going to give you some. I'll give you one here, Amanda, that is so powerful and deceptively simple that most sales reps overlook it. So I'm going to underwhelm you with this very powerful question. When you've finished your dialogue and asking questions and gotten your feedback, ask them, are you ready for this? Is there anything else that I should know? Now, the first time I heard that, it was kind of like the air being let out of a balloon. That's it? Well, I went and tried it, and the customer volunteered alphabet soup style everything else I should have asked and didn't. So the simple question, is there anything else that I should know? Is there anything I forgot to ask you? If you've yeah, created that's a, great a dialogue. Open -ended question. Yeah. Yeah. Just so I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Well, it doesn't look like I have any additional questions coming in at the moment. That's Greg, fine. I thank They're you very much for right. your time today and for doing the second series on the three biggest mistakes. I know everyone's looking forward to the final conclusion of this series. Very good. Well, Amanda, thanks for having me. And the next one is going to be around the six crucial skills that salespeople have to continue to polish and develop over their career if they're going to be effective. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank every everyone for their participation in today's webinar. Again, also thanking Greg for sharing his knowledge and expertise on selling staffing services. The recording of the webinar will be available on our website at www.tricom.com slash resources. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact either Greg or myself directly. Contact information is on your screen. 
Thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session, which will be held in June around the healthcare um, updates. So with that, um, I will close everything out. And thanks again, Greg. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Amanda. Okay.